Welcome back to another edition of the Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. I'm Bob Petrucci, joined by fellow Master Coaches, Mick Haley, Tom Hilbert, and Jim Stone. Today we have a little different uh, format that we're going to be using. We're going to have Jim Stone actually doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with Tom Hogan, all right, the Director of Operations for League One. And then we'll all be back for our buzz reaction. So, Jim, why don't you go ahead and uh, take a minute and introduce our guest, all right, and then we'll get uh, Tom on. Well, uh, Tom has had, uh, uh, how should I phrase this, a, a varied volleyball career. I mean, he started out as a club coach back in Cincinnati, and actually one of his former players, Danielle Meyer at that time, played for me at Ohio State and was a great player there. And then Tom matriculated to uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, he was assistant coach for the Olympic team with uh, Jenny Longping, uh, and uh, they took a silver medal at the Olympics. He then got into the collegiate world and was a very, very successful coach at the University of Denver for many years. And now he's he's morphed into uh, uh, he, he's joined the administrative dark side. You know, he's out, out of direct coaching, but uh, he still has uh, his his hands into volleyball and is growing some some pretty interesting projects with League One. So. Um, we're glad Tom was able to join us. So, Tom, can you can you hear me okay? And uh, we're all good. Yeah, I got you, Jim. Good. Well, first of all, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of volleyball stuff, but you know, I think um, a lot of people out there. I mean, you're you're a pretty popular dude, and, and uh, they a lot of people know that uh, you had some health challenges, you know, a couple of years ago. And, and can you provide an update on that and how? how your health is and, and how you're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim, for asking, too. Um, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, just for the audience, uh, for people that don't know, um, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer um, roughly two years ago, and I went through a pretty intense uh, battle of chemotherapy, and I came out good on the other end, um, so I'm cancer-free. Um, and so all the scans and blood work and everything like that um, have been positive. Um, I feel great. I mean, the only thing that we're trying to kick here at the Hogan household is uh, that that cold that keeps going around. It's like it's like a game of tag where I've been it like three times. Um, so other than that, <laughs> that, the health is pretty good. Well, whenever you're in a house full of kids, the uh, <laughs> the, the colds never cease. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining us today. And, I, I, and I, I'm so glad that you're here because I think there's a lot of curiosity you know, out in the volleyball community about League One. And I'm I'm sure you can answer a whole bunch of questions. And, you know, I know, Tom, with, within any organization, uh, there's lots of moving parts. And we're not going to ask you to have expertise on all the moving parts today. We're just going to focus on, on your moving part. And then as time goes along and uh, as we move forward, hopefully we can get... Um, you know, some of the League One, some of your League One colleagues on the show and and explore a little more about the organization and the projects that you guys have going. So with all that being said, um, can you kind of give an overview um, from 10,000 feet on the League One organization and then kind of narrow that focus down in terms of what's your job title? And then within that job title, what are your responsibilities inside of League One. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, so League One Volleyball, um, so we shorten it to love, um, spelled L-O-V-B, um, is one holistic ecosystem for club and pro volleyball. And the idea behind love is supporting athletes uh, through their entire volleyball journey um, from getting introduced to the sport and developing as youth players uh, to supporting their recruitment to college programs, um, to creating pathways for athletes uh, to play professional volleyball here in the U.S. following college, um, built from the community up. Um, so we were founded in 2020, and since that time, we're now the largest youth club business in the country with 51 club locations uh, across the country and growing. 
Um, later this year, uh, we're launching our pro league in six cities. Um, and I know we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and, and the league will feature some of the very best professional volleyball players in the world, um, including several USA gold medal champions uh, from the last Olympics. Um, so that's kind of the, the big overview and then kind of narrowing it down to my role. Um, I'm the head of sport uh, for Love Pro. And uh, I have three buckets that I oversee and that I'm responsible for. Um, so the three buckets, the first one, talent acquisition. Um, so that's the identification and acquisition of players, coaches, and staff uh, for the pro league. Um, volleyball operations, uh, mainly things that affect the athlete experience like travel, uh, training facilities, living, transportation, health and wellness. Um, and then the third thing is uh, the development of rules, policies, and procedures uh, for the league and for competition. Um, so that's everything from the competitive schedule, uh, the match protocol, uh, league standings, and things like that. And as you know, Jim, I've experienced every level of volleyball throughout my career. Um, and I mean, from club to high school to college, I coached professionally overseas um, to international coaching uh, for our country's national team. And after stepping back um, from the collegiate game, I was really looking forward to a new challenge and bringing a true international volleyball product to the U.S. really spoke to me. And the reason behind that is that the average American volleyball fan has never really truly experienced it before. You know, you ask your normal volleyball fan in the U.S., like, who, who's the best team in the world? And they'll respond like Texas, Wisconsin, or Nebraska, <laughs> you know, in, in the world. Uh, yeah, I even took my, uh, the, the U-20 team that I took to world championships, the USA team. I took down to Mexico for the world championships this past summer. I asked them the same question and I got the same answers. Um, and then fortunately we played Brazil the next day. And uh, even the Brazilian junior national team, one of our players, uh, Flynn, she was just like, I've never seen players like that before. And I was like, yeah, and that's their junior team. <laughs> and so as you and I know, like uh, there are many pro teams out there, uh, that are, that are higher level than those teams uh, that that every normal U.S. volleyball fan mentions, um, but they just never seen it, you know, that level in person. So true, professional international volleyball um, is this a high level of ball control? It's fast and physical play where the margin for error is thin, um, where you can see different styles of play on the court, different cultures coming together. Um, and so I really believe that U.S. Uh, fan is going to fall in love with international volleyball. Um, so as director of sport, I got a lot to do, um, but it's exciting and energizing uh, to be part of the organization at this time, for sure. Well, let's uh, kind of, I guess, staying with the theme of big picture down to small picture. Um, if we could look at what you're doing with le the league, the, the franchises, if, if you could uh, provide some information on, you know, what are the franchises that are going to be playing mm -hmm. and you know, what's what cities and, and a little bit about the venues, be it a practice venue, be it a, a competitive facility. Uh, if you can kind of um, provide some information in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the first season, um, we're going to have Atlanta, Austin, Houston, Madison, Omaha and Salt Lake. Um, so we've selected communities, you know, that have deep ties to volleyball. Um, from the youth level to college programs um, where they already have passionate and established fan bases to tap into. Um, uh, in terms of the league itself, uh, do you want me to get into the schedule or do you want me to get into the training sites? It's up to you. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a, a real formal script here, but let me, while I'm blabbing here, uh, you mentioned the six cities. Yeah. Did, did you you being uh, love love VB, did you go out and solicit those cities? Did they come to you? What were the mechanics on that? Yeah, no, we did a study. So we, I think we originally started with about 48 cities. Um, and we did a study of uh, the volleyball fan bases within that population. Um, and, and, you know, whether that's certain metrics um, like viewership or attendance. Um, so we really analyzed a lot of different cities and those were the six cities that we landed on for season one. Um, and, and I think, you know, you, you can even think about those cities as being just volleyball crazy cities where you have those huge fan bases 
uh, a huge volleyball community within those cities um, that are really eager to have that pro volleyball come to their city. Um, so a lot of the choices the city were actually made before I got there. Um, some of the last selections were made while I was there, um, but I kind of got to see the nuts and bolts behind the selection process and it was pretty elaborate. Um, but I think we landed on the, the six best cities for season one. And then, okay, once, once we, not we, you, <laughs> um, selected those cities, um, what next? I mean, you know, what, what, what were you looking for relative to practice facilities? And then, so obviously, most important is playing facilities. Mm -hmm. Are you in big arenas, small arenas? I mean, what was the thought behind that? Yeah, well, each of these cities um, have love club communities built into them. Um, so we have that that huge commu community already uh, there, um, but they, they also have the club facilities as well. Um, so in terms of training venues, um, we'll be using our club facilities located in each love host city. Um, so we've invested millions of dollars in upgrading our facilities, our pro and club homes um, to be ready um, so that our pros have their own locker room, sports med room, uh, recovery space, offices, meeting space, stuff like that. Um, However, like we want to have this all within our club ecosystem. You know, our athletes will be training in the same facilities as our host clubs and our club athletes will get to interact with our pro players, watch them practice and aspire to be love pro athletes themselves. Um, in terms of the competition venues um, within those cities, we'll be competing in arenas um, and, and venues will be most likely between 3000 and 10,000 seat capacity. Um, and the reason behind that is we want to create a really cool and intimate atmosphere uh, where the building will shake when the home team scores a winning point in a five setter. Um, you know, we don't want to have a hollowed out arena in season one. Um, we want to create an exciting atmosphere, uh, you know, where you can cut the competitive tension with the knife. And the, the host cities um, have those sites, the competitive sites, have they been selected yet? Like, that's that's mission accomplished or are you still in the process of doing research and nego negotiation and that type of thing? Yeah, no, those sites have been selected. Um, we're still working through the contract process with that. Um, but I do think within the coming weeks, um, we will be announcing um, those sites. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can't really mention them because we're still in contract negotiations with some of them. Um, but, yeah, we those those uh, arenas have been selected. Okay, so we got uh, we got our practice facility, and we will have our competitive facility. Mm -hmm. And now um, we need players. <laughs> um, but before we get to players, um, we need a schedule. Um, yeah. What What's going on with League One? You uh, can you provide just kind of a time frame in terms of practice starts here, season starts there. We're going to take some breaks here. Is there going to be a end of season championship? So somewhat of the infrastructure you have for the scheduling. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really proud of the season schedule we developed. So we uh, consulted with our athletes, um, with the national team staff, a lot of top volleyball minds in the community. Um, and we came up with a really cool season design and structure. So our entire season will begin on November 11th of 2024, and it will go through April 12th weekend of 2025. Um, so we'll start our preseason this November, which is less than eight months away, which is crazy to say. <laughs> it's like it's it's definitely approaching uh, rather quickly, uh, but it's very exciting. Um, but kind of getting into the nuts and bolts, um, our athletes will move in um, from November 1st uh, through no November 10th. Um, November 11th is report day. Um, so we're going to have two and a half uh, solid weeks of training where teams can build their systems Athletes have time to develop. Um, coaches can implement their team cultures. Um, it'll be a really good ramp into the season. Um, and then for Thanksgiving, uh, we'll have five days off. And when I told members of our athlete council this, um, we had some players that started crying. You know, I'm not going to mention any names, Haley Washington. Um, <laughs> but they were so excited that they actually got to spend Thanksgiving at home, you know, with their family, where they haven't done that, you know, some athletes for decades. Um, because they've just been playing overseas and they don't recognize Thanksgiving. So that was kind of a cool moment uh, to see their reaction to getting Thanksgiving off. Um, but then after Thanksgiving, we'll come back and train some more. Um, 
We'll have uh, preseason competitions in December. So one per team. Um, and that's really just to get the competitive rust off, iron out the wrinkles for the event and broadcast. Um, and, and, you know, really let coaches test out lineups. Um, and, and then following that in December, we'll have one full week off for the winter holidays. And so that's December 22nd through the 29th. Um, and then our competitive season will begin in early January. And so we'll have a mid and end of the season tournament. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in terms of our regular season, so matches will rotate format between Love Pro Cities throughout the season, week to week. So we'll have, let's just say on a given week, we'll have a weekday matchup. So one weekday head-to-head -head match between two teams at One Love City. Um, and then we'll have what's called weekends with love. Um, so one weekend, three match series between four teams at One Love City. And so the best is just to kind of give you an example of what like a typical week would look like. Um, so let's say on Thursday, uh, Love Atlanta travels to Love Madison and plays a match, right? So it's just a normal home and away on a Thursday. Um, and that's the only match that those two teams will have that week. Um, and so the other four teams uh, will have a weekends with Love series. Um, so let's just say the host city is Love Salt Lake, right? Um, and, and so those other three teams will fly into Love Salt Lake. Um, and on Friday, let's say uh, Friday evening, they'll have one match. And let's say Love Austin uh, or Love Houston plays against Love Salt Lake. Um, and then Saturday, um, let's say around 4 p.m., Love Houston plays against Love Austin, um, again, in Salt Lake. And then for that night match, Love Omaha plays against Love Salt Lake. Um, so you have three uh, pro matches um, with four teams. So roughly speaking, in terms of a regular season, each team will have one match a week uh, for about two thirds of the regular season and two matches a week for about one third of the regular season. And I really like the weekends with love format uh, because it allows our fans who are maybe not based in one of our love cities. So people interested in seeing high level professional international volleyball, um, they can see three matches um, and four teams compete in 24 hours, right? So let's say you're Jim Stone and you live in Fort Collins, Colorado, okay? You know, you're thinking about going to, to Salt Lake to watch a match, um, but maybe it's not worth your while if you're just going for one match and, you know, for two hour experience. Um, but if you can go to, to, you know, Salt Lake and watch uh, four teams compete in three high level pro matches all within 24 hours, um, I think, you know, you, you consider that, you know, um, so I think we'll attract fans from outside of our love cities um, to come and watch our, our love teams play. So it's really excited. And, you know, having six teams, you know, we, we really wanted to be creative with that um, and having kind of two different formats. Um, and so I think we accomplished our goal in terms of I, I mentioned the tournaments at the beginning, um, but we'll have a midseason and end of season tournament. So our midseason tournament is called the Love Classic. And so this is where all six of our teams will compete. And it's in conjunction uh, with the Triple Crown Tournament in Kansas City. Um, and that's at the arena con connected to the convention center. So I think it's like really cool to have like the future of volleyball in our country, watch and experience high level pro volleyball, getting to see all six of our teams compete, which I think is really cool. And then the end of the season uh, tournament is our love finals. And so we're still... Uh, we have it down to two final locations. And so we're still working through that. Um, but all teams will compete for the title. And so the top two teams um, that are ranked in, in terms of the regular season will get buys into the semis. Um, so we'll have a quarterfinals, semis, and then finals to crown um, the season one championship. But in terms of kind of my love for the season structure and schedule, you know, I think you have a preseason to develop. So our athletes, our teams, we get to develop an international product. We have holiday breaks, which is really good for the mental health uh, up for our players and staff. So spending time with family and friends, uh, shortened and light competitive season. So less wear and tear on the athletes' bodies um, and more recovery in between international and pro. So, so time for mental and physical recovery. So they'll have like solid weeks or even months at the beginning of our pro season at the end. Um, if we do have those national team athletes, we will have time to recover um, in between those two seasons. So like for me, it's just, you know, prolonging the athletes' careers. 
And my, my experience with the national team is that, you know, when I was in that gym, a lot of those really high level athletes uh, would quit in the prime of their careers, you know, because they really couldn't take the grind of the national team season, the, inter the professional season, and there weren't any breaks. It was just constant. And obviously being away from their family and friends really took a toll as well. Um, so I think, you know, really lightening the load, um, creating a more condensed season, having breaks, having recovery periods, uh, really taking their mental health into consideration. I think that's really going to extend players' careers to where they'll play well into their 30s and even 40s. You know, as you were speaking, you fostered a bunch of questions. So okay. <laughs> uh, if it's OK, I'll throw some random things at you. Um, but I've heard you say um, that um, the league will be player friendly. And yeah. you kind of what you just described in terms of the scheduling, um, is is that what you mean by player friendly? Are there other components that enter into that moniker of uh, this is going to be a, a league that takes care of its athletes? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Jim. And I mean, that's something that I'm extremely proud of. And that's something that really drew me to love. Um, it's, you know, all the way from Caitlin, our CEO, to Rosie, our COO, all the way down, everyone really believes in, in taking care of our athletes. So our athletes um, inform and shape every decision we make. You know, their experience is important to us. And, it, and at the center of every conversation we have, every decision we make, like it's our athletes. And so I would say there's eight, yeah, different ways that we're an athlete friendly league. Um, I just mentioned one of them, the season schedule on how I really think it benefits the athletes and will extend their careers. Um, another really important aspect uh, to our athlete friendly league is um, our athlete council, you know, which we started over three years ago. Um, and our athletes have a voice in every aspect of our league. And this is very uncommon in, in leagues across the world. Um, but they have a voice from the volleyballs we'll, we'll compete with um, to the rules of competition to the gear we'll wear, uh, to the recovery equipment in each location, all the way to the season schedule, our athletes drive our league. Um, another aspect is transportation and accommodation. Um, we're gonna cover the travel to and from um, our athletes designated sites. Um, we're also covering the, the living and transportation once they arrive in the city. Um, another huge aspect, and I think this is monumental, is health benefits. Um, so once you join Love, you become a member of our organization. So um, as you know, Jim, like pros are normally independent contractors in mostly all leagues across the world. Um, but we're changing the game. Our athletes are going to be essentially employees of our organization. Um, so they're going to enjoy like one of the best benefit packages of any league in the world. I mean, it is amazing. And I get to see the budgets. So I get to see how much this costs. And it is amazing how much we're putting you know, forward for them, uh, which I think is well-deserved. Uh, but everything from health, vision, dental, um, high-level medical care and prevention, maternity, child care assistance, uh, professional development opportunities, even 401k, you know, so really groundbreaking stuff, which I think is great. And I think it's about time. Um, and another benefit to uh, us being an athlete-friendly league is our contracts. Um, so we have no cut clauses, um, no trade clauses in our contracts. Um, you won't be cut at any time during the season due to performance, injury, or even being replaced by a rental player from overseas. Um, there's no designation to our practice squad or being waived. Um, once you make a commitment to us, um, we make a commitment to you and you're, you're on a love team, right? Uh, their area is competitive equity. Um, you know, so we're not going to have one or two or even three teams dominating our league. We're going to have six competitive teams um, where in any given match, anyone can win. And I think this is really important. It's good for the fans, right? The excitement of coming to an intense match. So there's not going to be a lot of three O's or O threes. Um, and it's good for the players, you know, knowing they can win on any night. Um, but I, I really don't think you can find this kind of equity in most leagues across the world. You normally have like two or three monster teams dominating the entire league. Um, but that's not going to be the case with us. And then I think uh, the two last important aspects, and I think they're really important, um, community and club integration. I think this is awesome. I got to experience a little bit of this when I coached over in Europe. 
because um, they kind of have a similar model where they have clubs at the base of their pro teams. Um, but our athletes get to be heroes and role models for the next generation of volleyball players. You know, they'll be celebrities not only in, in their communities, but also in their own training facility. Um, they'll have an impact uh, on the sport and show young girls from all over the country and even the world um, that they too can play professional volleyball in the U.S. And, and then last and not least, but I, I think a way that we're kind of changing the game is that we're building our athletes' brands and legacies. Um, so we're really turning the volleyball world upside down. So, so most pro leagues uh, promote the league first, um, kind of the team second and players last. And we're really flipping this model upside down by promoting our players first. So we believe that promoting our players will connect them to the communities and the fans. Um, it's also gonna create opportunities for our players to grow their names and brands and in return create avenues for them to have endorsements and sponsors. Um, but when I was out on the recruiting road, you know, domestically and traveling internationally, the response that I received from athletes when we just kind of explained who we are and what we're all about in, in these uh, things that I just spoke to, um, the response we got was great. I mean, it was like, it's about time, you know, thank you for finally valuing the athlete, you know, thank you for thinking of us in these decisions, you know, you guys are changing the game and making others change. Um, so the responses were amazing and very validating that we're doing this in the right way. Okay, I got two more things yeah. um, before we get into um, players and rosters and, and that type of thing. Um, each of the six franchises, I'm, I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, will have a marketing staff to promote, sell tickets, match administration, that type of thing. Is that correct? And then part two of that is your mid-season and end-of-season tournaments. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm assuming it's more than just a trophy. I mean, is there, is there some, some cash bonuses for winning these things? I mean, how, how are we working both the local administration and then the end of season and mid season tournaments? No, yeah, those are great questions. Um, and so for each one of our, our city's teams, um, we will have uh, local staff, right? So we'll have operations people, we'll have marketing people, social media, um, so we'll have that's physically at that location, as well as our central staff as well, you know, in terms of marketing partnerships and everything else. Um, so we'll have a mixture of both, right? So we'll have a central, uh, staff and then we'll have, um, you know, staffs at each cities. Um, you know, in, in terms, sorry, your, your second question. Uh, prize money at yeah. the mid season end of season tournament. Oh yeah, Absolutely. So, so we will have awards um, for that mid-season tournament. Um, and then we're gonna have uh, a, a, a awards, meaning awards and bonuses. And then we'll have that for the end of the season uh, as well. And we'll have uh, positional bonuses and awards. Um, we'll have MVP, we'll have team bonuses and awards. Um, yeah, so we'll have uh, a, a good amount of money, cash, awards. Uh, to give to the players. Um, we're still working with sponsors to improve those dollar amounts. We don't have like a set amount yet, um, but we are uh, going to have very generous uh, awards to, to give to the players for sure. Okay. Moving ahead. Um, you know, we could take about two hours on this. So <laughs> <laughs> we got about 10 more minutes. So um, that's right. I got time, Jim. <laughs> um, okay. How are, how are rosters being developed? You know, at, at the start of the of the of the call here, you you had a real emphasis on on international participation in this and international players coming over. Um, as you develop your roster, are the limitation are are there any limitations on international players? And then once a player expresses an interest in in playing in the league. What then? I mean, where do they go to play? Is it uh, is there a draft? Is there are, are players just assigned to a team? So if you can give kind of an overview mm -hmm. of, of how rosters are being developed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll kind of hit your first question um, in terms of international players. Um, our target goal is four international players per team. Um, and we're close to achieving this, um, but I think it's an important aspect of introducing the American volleyball community um, to international volleyball. 
Um, but a, a majority of our rosters will be pro players from the U.S. Um, in terms of rules and, and, and limits of who can play, um, we don't have any. Um, so the best players will play in our league and the coaches get to decide that. Um, in, in terms of uh, roster formation, um, again, we allocate players to the different cities and to the different rosters on the, each one of those teams. Um, but our players do have a voice um, in the city in which they play. Um, so we ask every player their preference. And we can't guarantee them where, where they will go, but we try to accommodate them. Um, and, and so we want to place the players in cities where it makes you know the most sense, right? Um, you know, could be that they have a strong connection to a certain community, whether they attended college there, um, they grew up in that area, uh, they played club in that area, they have family there. Um, there are a lot of factors that we consider. Um, and like I spoke before, you know, we want to create balanced rosters. Um, so that we can offer a great experience um, to our fans and players. Um, in terms of the, the, the timeline for, for rosters, we've all almost finalized our 84 athlete roster. Um, so we've closed out several positions and we have just a spot or two left out of our 84, if you can believe it. Um, but we've been announcing their signing um, with love publicly in small groups, and then um, we'll, we will be announcing, we're moving towards announcing their city desi designation in the coming months. Um, but what I can say is that we're gonna have six stacked rosters filled with talent. Um, and, and I think the league will be starting at a higher level, much more than I originally anticipated, um, because I think what we're doing and what we're all about spread like wildfire across the international and US volleyball community uh, and so we're really fortunate to sign the athletes that we've signed, 100%. And, and you mentioned um, earlier, um, you, you alluded to uh, there's, there's no cutting going on. There's no trading of players going on. Um, what if a player has an end of season injury? I'm assuming they can be replaced. And yeah. do you have, uh, for lack of a better term, practice players where, hey, I'm not good enough. Well, maybe I should ask first, what is the roster size? And yeah. do you have two or three players that will be, you know, just in case type players that are perhaps younger and, and learning how to play at the international level? So can you kind of speak to that uh, way too long of question? <laughs> no, that's great. Um, yeah, so our rosters um, will be 14 athletes. Um, per roster. And so that was kind of the 84 number that I alluded to earlier. Um, and, and so we're not going to have practice players or players that can be moved down to the practice squad. All of our athletes um, will be on our roster. And if, you know, we do have that unfortunate event that an athlete does have a season ending injury, um, we will be looking to replace them um, because we do have kind of a little bit on the smaller side of, of roster numbers. Um, so we will be giving that team another player to play with. I'm hopefully knock on wood um, that we do not encounter that situation during season one. Um, but if it does happen, we do have a plan in place for that, for sure. Okay. So when you say, uh, you know, we, in essence, it's you um, is making all the roster decisions. Hello, Tom. Tom, can you hear me? And I can hear you. I was All just right. going to text you and say you're frozen. <laughs> well, right back at you. You were frozen too. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, just so just so I'm clear. Um, you're the godfather. I mean, you make all the all the roster decisions in terms of where people play. Um, if somebody gets hurt, you're the one that's assigning somebody else to take their place. If it's a season injury, in season ending injury, so like you're the man. You're you're making these choices. Well, as much as I love the, that reference, because I love The Godfather, the, the movie especially, um, <laughs> uh, we we do have uh, a full recruiting team: um, Daniel Scott, Michelle Chapman Smith, Maggie Upright, um, Keith Barnett, we, and several people. Um, and, and so a, a lot of everything that we do, um, we do collectively. Um, so we, we do decide, you know, we're, we have long discussions about rosters and balancing it out and, you know, what pins go where and, 
and this and that. Um, so I do have a full team behind me that's supporting me um, with all these decisions that we have to make completely. Okay. Are there, I, I know there's, there's USA national team players yeah. that have declared that they're going to play for uh, league one next year. Um, can you, um, what well, provide, I, I know you can't list 84 players, but, what, <laughs> but who are the national team players that will be playing for league one next year? Yeah. Um, I, I can mention a lot of them. Um, just, off the top of my head, Lauren Carlini, Danielle Catino, Logan Eggleston, Zoe Fleck, uh, Serena Gray, who we just released, uh, Micah Hancock, Ronnie Jones Perry, um, Jordan Poulter, uh, Kelsey Robinson Cook, um, Jordan Thompson, Haley Washington, Sarah Will Hype Parsons, Justine Wong Orentes, um, and then a, a ton more that we've signed that I'll be able to announce at a later date due to contracts. Sure. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have the U.S. national team covered. Um, a lot of our athletes come from there. And, and that's, you know, a point that we're very proud of. Um, as so, you know, I, I coached the, the U.S. national team. Or I was a coach on the U.S. national team. And so it was, uh, um, it's definitely a very special place. And um, it's filled with a ton of great athletes. And we're lucky to have a lot of them. So in the perfect world, when would rosters be finalized and become public? Well, I originally anticipated that it was going to be more towards June or July, um, but with our uh, popularity and how fast we've signed athletes, I think it will be uh, sooner than that. I think in, in the coming weeks, maybe a month or two, we should be releasing um, where athletes are designated to and what city they're going to, to be playing in. Okay. And can you, any information on coaches? Uh, yeah. So, you know, we have uh, recently announced uh, the signing of very talented uh, internationally experienced coaches like Massimo Barberlini, Tama Miyashiro, uh, Susie Fritz, Matt Furbringer, um, like having world class players. Um, we know how important it is to feature elite level coaches with significant international experience um, to deliver the type of product we want to see on the floor. Um but we'll be introducing two more head coaches um, that we've signed within the next couple of weeks as well. Okay. I'm going to uh, take a, a little bit of a left turn here um, before we come back to rosters. Okay. Um, that's, that, that's a lot of USA players, USA national team players, which yeah. is great um, to keep that quality of player at home, I think is fantastic and allow people to see them. What what is your relationship with USA Volleyball? Um, is there one? Um, are they supportive? Are they are they Switzerland and just staying neutral? I mean, can can you uh, make any comments in that regard? Yeah, I, I think we have a great partnership um, with USA Volleyball as an organization. Um, but but then uh, also just you know on the pro side, um, I. I, I definitely asked them for their opinions and their insights um, in terms of the national team staff, um, you know, from season design uh, to rules of play um, to everything and kind of saying like, Hey, what do you guys, um, what, what can help you develop and grow as a national team program? Um, but again, yeah, in terms of pro leagues in the U S you know, they have to be neutral. Um, but we do have a great relationship with them. Fair enough. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, got to make this fast here. Uh, can you talk about uh, once you got uh, a venue, now I got a roster, now we're playing matches, and I got love weekend of volleyball. What volleyball are you playing with? <laughs> and, and, yeah. and part two of that is what, what rules do you have? Uh, okay. Are you playing by international rules or how's that working? No, that's great. Um, yeah, so we'll be announcing our ball partner shortly, um, but we will be using an international ball that's certified by the FIVB. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the rules of play, we will be using uh, international rules, um, but we're considering a couple minor tweaks and we'll be able to share more on that a little bit later um, in, into this year. Um, but I think it's important, you know, to the athletes in our league that we stick to international rules. Um, as a lot of our athletes have Olympic aspirations, 
or have multiple Olympics in their goal sets. And I think it's important that we stick uh, to a similar style of play that will help them uh, develop as players. You know, it, it's interesting. And, and um, I, I'm just wondering, and I don't expect an answer uh, necessarily. If you have an opinion, fire away. But I'm just wondering if the, the rules relative to international play, specifically substitution, um, if that's going to filter down into the colleges and clubs where, where players are, are not going to be satisfied with being three rotation players. And they might make some demands uh, in, in a good way on coaches to help them develop their all around game rather than just be, I hit, I hit right side and it's the only set I hit. And there's, they put all their skills into a box rather than having diversified skill set. So I'm, I'm just wondering what the trickle down effect will be, if any. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, just like those old Ohio State rosters that Jim Stone used to have, you know, those complete <laughs> players. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, I do. I, I, I do think you'll see some trickle down effect. Um, uh, and I, but I also think that the FIBB is considering rule changes as well. Um, I, I've heard a lot of really interesting and unique changes, um, and they do it every four years. And I think this next year um, is one of the years where they do make changes. Um, but, you know, whatever changes they do make, um, we'll be implementing um, to our league. But I completely agree with you. I think it could change how college and, and club is being played. Yeah. Hey, um, one wrap up question, Tom, and then then I certainly want to give you time to hit on any bullet points that, that we may have not have discussed. But um, I, I, I hear college players uh, quote endorsing League One. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what that meant, but it's I guess it's happening. Can you kind of explain that a little bit just for, I guess, the education of me as well as maybe the viewers? What does mm -hmm. endorsing League One mean? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's good to provide some like clarification and insight. Um, athletes that are signed to NILs with love are signing with the club side of the organization. Um, so they do stuff that's direct, directly related to our clubs, whether that's uh, tournament appearances, youth clinics and stuff like that. Um, the pro league really has nothing to do with that side of the house and the NI deals NIL deals <laughs> that the club side makes with those collegiate athletes. Um, but, you know, just for clarification, there are two sides of love, right? you got the club, the club and the pro side, um, which means there are two sides of the fiscal house. Um, so the club side does not pay for the pro league, um, like through club fees, um, like the club fees do not fund the pro league. And the pro side does not pay for any club related activities um, like NILs or tournaments and things like that. So there's two separate sides of the house uh, at love. Interesting. Well, as, as a wrap up, anything that we've missed, Tom, that you want to make sure the viewers are aware of? Not really. I, I would just say, you know, tune into our social media channels for all the releases and information. We're going to have a ton of it <laughs> coming in. <laughs> In, in the next uh, month or two, and, and even kind of going into the summer, we'll have a lot of really exciting stuff to announce. Um, I wish I could uh, have maybe have uh, mentioned some of those things today, but that's okay. You know, contracts are contracts. Um, so, so we will have a lot of really cool stuff to announce. Um, and so just tune in to the social media channels, follow us. Um, but it's, it's going to be a really exciting time for volleyball in the U.S. Well, hopefully we can have you or it any of your colleagues uh, at League One back um, as we yeah. get clo closer to the season. Well, certainly when, when rosters and coaches are announced, we'd love to have you back. Absolutely. Um, so you're, you're always welcome. You've been a treasure trove of information. And uh, <laughs> we appreciate your time because I know that uh, you're a busy guy. So thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Anytime I get to speak with my Ohio brethren, uh, it's, it's a good day for me. <laughs> well, given the snow that's coming to Colorado tomorrow, I think I'd rather be in Ohio. So, yeah, we'll, that's we'll true. See. All, right, All right, thanks so much, Tom. All right, take care, Jim. Yep. Okay, I think we're being joined by the. Uh, speaking of Godfather, Godfather Bob Bertucci <laughs> is is back in charge of the keyboard. So, Bob, where do we want to go from here? 
Can't hear you, Bob. Sorry, Jim. Uh, just <laughs> before we continue our discussion, uh, you know, and go into our buzz reaction, uh, let's just take a minute to talk about our sponsor, SMA Sports. Uh, any of our viewers that might be looking for top volleyball equipment for their team or their facility, uh, you don't have to look any further than SNA Sports Group. Uh, it's an industry leader uh, in volleyball nets, poles, and accessories with decades of experience and commitment to excellence. So SA Sports has everything you need to elevate your game. So just go ahead and visit sasports.com and learn today what, what you might need to supplement your, your facility or your needs. So with that being said, uh, let's jump into our, our buzz reaction. So Mick, reactions that you had for you know, from listening to Tom Hogan, give us, and I thought it was a, a Trevor th treasure throw of information as, as Jim uh, related. Well, I need to preface my remarks here. I was stunned. Uh, we talk about NIL and we talk about uh, what's going on in the collegiate ranks. And we've talked about that not being sustainable. Uh, what I heard, I can't comprehend um, how many dollars that would cost, especially the uh, uh, benefit part of the package. Um, and we all know what it, what it costs for medical insurance these days and that sort of thing. You know, I want to wave a flag for the effort, but realistically, I don't think this flies, in my opinion. And I'll tell you why. The players want exposure. Um, and I don't care where they are, they want exposure. This sounds like... Um, when my kids played Little League and everybody got a trophy. Um, and that bothers me a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know how you pay for all these things. Uh, we talked about how many athletes, Jim, you mentioned, uh, you asked Tom how many athletes, U.S. athletes were going to be there. And yet we're going to have four uh, allotted international athletes on the team. Um, who's going to play um, when you get all these good athletes together and they want exposure? I can't see TV doing this. Um, I, I just don't see that. And TV money is where all the leagues make it, right? I mean, there's not a league functioning that's not getting television uh, backing. So there, I think there are three major things that I wrote down. Um, and I want to make sure that I, I'm fair on this, but uh, the economics of the league seem to be challenging. Uh, at one point, Jim, you got Tom to say something about broadcasting never came back up. Uh, I assume broadcasting meant uh, television, uh, but you think about playing three matches in a weekend at one site, um, there's just not enough exposure. Uh, I think f let's look at it from the athlete's standpoint. If you get hired here and you get a good salary, you got a year, you pretty much are going to be on easy street. Uh, it looked like to me, um, I don't know if this concept is a good concept. And the first thing that Tom said was, we want a lifetime experience. In other words, starting starting in the club and staying in the club through your life of your, your volleyball experience. That seems to me to be uh, limiting. <laughs> what came to my mind is socialism. <laughs> but it, it was kind of a funny thought, uh, not something serious, but... Um, a lot of concepts that I have trouble wrapping my head around. So I'll leave it at that and let somebody else speak. All right, I think we'll go ahead and go to Tom. What was your reactions, Tom? 
Well, I, I'll have to say that I'm not going to judge whether or not it's feasible or possible financially, but I think that uh, the athlete friendly thing is, you know, and getting benefits and that kind of thing. It's really seems like that's an important priority for them. And I'm sure that that is uh, how they, I think, plan on uh, retention and attraction of international players because uh, they, those players will feel like, hey, this is a good place for me in terms of whole life and the holistic experience. Uh, so I, I, I think that that's a good strategy, but I, I think I somewhat agree with Mick in that that's going to be really expensive and uh, it's going and the, the no cut clause and those types of things, that's going to be, I don't, I'm not sure how practical that is. That sounds like, you know, when you're a college coach and your AD says you're not allowed to cut players and there's times when you're like, you want me to be good or not, you know? Yeah. And so, I, and, and, you know, I, but I applaud them for, for this philosophy because I think it will attract talent. Um, but it's interesting. And then, um, uh, again, Mick discussed this, and, and I got to give Tom Hogan a little bit of of leeway on this because we never asked the question about TV, but that has to be a major part of what they're trying to do. I, I, all both of the pro leagues, and I think the PVF still has some questions to answer there too. They've got to get a good TV package if they want to support this financially. And then... I find it interesting, and I'm, I'd throw this question out to you guys: Who benefits from this, the, the scheduling and the timing of these leagues? So, like, does League One benefit from watching the PVF for a year to see if they're making mistakes, to see how it's going? Is that a benefit to League One, or is it a benefit to the PVF, which I kind of think it is that they're the first ones out of the gate? Um, and then who's going to benefit next year from that overlapping of the schedule? Because they start a little bit earlier than PVF, but then they end before – and PVF will still have a month left in their season. Uh, who does that benefit? You know, that, it's very, very interesting stuff to me. And I think uh, it's going to be – it remains to be seen how this is handled. But it's obvious that um, that League One is very committed to some of these concepts that he's talking about. And uh, if they can make it work financially, it, it may be a pretty attractive league for some of these players. Well, uh, Tom, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying and a lot of what Mick's saying. Uh, you know, I, I listened very closely to what Tom Hogan was saying, and I want to believe everything he was saying. And I really hope it, it works the way he presented it. Um, but my, my concern is if it's if it's too good to be true, it's usually too good to be true. So I I think it's going to be it's going to be some it's it's going to eventually work its way to what what's sustainable uh, because I think mixed points are valid. Uh, you know, all ten of I actually had ten uh, player friendly items that that Tom had uh, addressed, and they were all great things. I mean, basically it's these athletes are going to be employees of this, of this company. Um, and, and I think they, they follow kind of a, a little bit of the pro model, but then a little bit of the, you know, international club model. It's kind of, it's kind of morphed between both things where I think the PVF is definitely a pro model from start to finish. Um, you know, where, where I think league one is, is kind of a combination of, a club system and a pro system kind of mixed together. And, and, and it may very well be the best combination. Uh, my concern is, is it attractive to television? Uh, you know, and, and uh, is it, is it sustainable? Uh, then it comes back to, you know, uh, where's the money going to come from to, to fund all these things. Uh, but it, it, it sounds tremendous. And, uh, and I think, you know, I don't know if both, both leagues can exist together maybe in the beginning, uh, but eventually I would see both of these leagues merging to become one big professional league in, in the USA. Maybe they could have a Super Bowl of volleyball at the end where both league champions play each other, you know? You know, um, the other thing, guys, that was said about the weekend, three matches or two, two matches on the weekend uh, with four teams with their clubs, the, the clubs – 
travel so much to these junior qualifiers and everything every weekend in the February through April time period. Um, and I know Tom said we separate the pro funds aren't going to be taken from the club and the club funds aren't going to support the pro. But he talked about right at the start that they have 51 clubs. Um, so I'm trying to get the, the, the vision of how the clubs and the pro merge, but they don't. Uh, they don't impact each other financially. And if that's the case, then what's the emphasis on playing four teams in one site at a weekend and two teams at a neutral site or another site on a Thursday night? Um, I've been watching uh, PVF play on different nights of the week, and the number of kids that we see in the stands is pretty, pretty uh, large. Uh, if they play on the weekends and on Thursday nights when the club teams get ready to travel on Friday and that sort of thing, or go Thursday night for Friday, Saturday, Sunday tournaments, um, just just talk, just thinking about the club system, that also stuck out to me as as a problem. I well, Nick, I, I think I think the that that Love Classic is a home run where where they're going to Kansas City and they're going to have you know all all six of the teams playing at the same time that that triple crowns running the event i mean it's going to be it's going to be a volleyball bonanza you know for that for that particular weekend anyway and and the exposure that the the the, the league one teams will get i think is tremendous maybe, maybe that's what tom you know sees a lot of this crossover between club and pro uh being a positive i i, I thought that i wrote that down too that's a really good idea and I would imagine it's really going to create some momentum at that time. Yeah, Mick, I have a question for you. Um, I hear what you're saying, some relative skepticism about the the financial model. Do you feel the same way about the PVF? Um, yeah, I, I do. Um, and both both groups have an initial have an initial funding of individuals putting up. $13 million and that sort of thing. PVF is easier to understand how they're going to spend their money. What's scary is they don't have a television contract and they, they seemingly have enough money to do that. We don't know. Well, we've, we've heard that there's maybe 50 million in the, um, in the league one group. Uh, at least they've announced that kind of money. We don't know what goes to the pro and what goes to the club and what goes to what, but, but money is what's going to make this work. Right guys. I mean, uh, and they have to bring in money to sustain it. They can't just get angel investors uh, to throw uh, Kevin Durant throws 13 million into each group or something like that. Uh, I don't know if that happened or not, but that's out on the street, but um, people think there's going to be a league. I, I think it's just going to be what league and, and how are they going to sustain this and how are they going to uh, fund some of these promises? I mean, these are, these are big things. Uh, I'm skeptical of all big things. Uh, I think Bob said it more accurately. If it seems skeptical, it probably is, but, um, but we've seen all this before and it's who's got the money. And who can pay the athletes? You you think these athletes are going to want all this stuff until they don't get paid, and then they're going to be back in Europe or someplace where they're getting paid, and they're getting paid over there. You know the good ones are getting paid over there three hundred thousand and more, um, and that's just a low ball figure. So think think about think about the money, and if they're employees, if they're employees of the company. What does that mean taxation-wise? We've been reading about this in collegiate sports where the Dartmouth uh, players want to go, want to be employees. And so what does that mean also? Those, those are questions I have that I don't have answers for. Um, so maybe I didn't no, answer I, your question. I but. think that, yeah, I, I think um, 
I mean, I, I think we all want this to fly. Um, we want professional volleyball in our country. The, 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 the head scratcher for me and, and maybe an unwarranted head scratcher was uh, if, if I own a franchise, it's like a college coach. Recruiting becomes important because this it's my job. So I spend a lot of time on it. If I own a franchise, I want butts in the seats. So the whole marketing thing becomes very important. If it's all coming out of a central location, um, do the marketing people have skin in the game uh, to the point that they're going to work hard? Maybe they will. Maybe they'll they'll fill up the 5,000 seat um, facility. You know, I hope they do. But uh, I, I guess we'll we'll find out. That, that was my little joke about socialism. It just seemed to me like there's no competition for players. So how do the players up their ante for income, you know? And so just the team winning, that hasn't been the case in any of the pro sports in this country. It's been pr production and owners wanting to win and that sort of thing. Um I think the players have benefited greatly from that, uh, from what I'm looking. <laughs> looking at all these free agents today in pro football, they're getting two years, $54 million and $50 million guaranteed. I mean, million. Think about that. Uh, so I, I, that's, I don't know. That's, that's, that's television money. That's, yeah, sure. And so sure, without that television money – um, I mean, to your point, you got to have a TV contract and maybe something's coming. I hope, I hope something is. Um, the one thing that I, I applaud and hopefully it works out is what can we do to bring in the best players? So it seems like he's aggressively recruiting the best people he can get in the world. Don't know who that is, but you know. Uh, oh, I mean, he's, I, he's, they've already started with a a good portion of the national team players. And if yeah. I'm, I'm with PVF, I'm, I'm going to be concerned about the fact that they have the whole Olympic team or a good portion of the Olympic team coming back to their roster. That's going to help attract a lot of the international players. Yeah. I mean, Mick, you're just out watching spring training. Do you, do you want to watch the Dodgers play or do you want to watch their double a farm team play? I mean, if, if, if a league, gets the best players, I think that's a draw to put for fans. I think it's a draw for TV contracts if they get the best players. And the quality of play is different. We'll see. We'll see who, at the end of the day, when they announce rosters, we'll see who's on the roster and if it, if there's going to be a big impact from the top people in the world. Here's Here's the thing, Jim. If they get the best players, how do I know they're the best players? If yeah. I can't see them back to the whole marketing component. Yeah. And that that's that's what I'm saying. That's where you you spend money, you know, to get people to get butts in the seat. And if I don't know they're the best players, so somebody has a name from overseas that I can't pronounce and they get 25 kills a match and I don't see them on TV. Uh, what's my motivation here? The, you're right about exposure at Triple Crown, but but that can go two ways also. So uh, I think it's good for the U.S. athletes for sure at Triple Crown because we need some heroes or heroines for our kids. Um, and that's a good idea. Um, but that really hasn't played out in the past yet to be really helpful when some other people have done some things like that in conjunction with junior tournaments. So uh, I think a lot of stuff to be seen here, a lot of stuff that we want to, will want to follow, but golly, I just, all of that stuff just made me just freeze up. I mean, I, I was stunned that they would put themselves out on a limb like this. Well, there you have it folks. <laughs> <laughs> and a special thanks to all our listeners um tune in again next week next week we'll be interviewing jesse salter salters uh on the evolution of volleyball numbers and statistics
Until next time, this has been the Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. Stay tuned for more volleyball excitement come next week.